When it comes to mid-air collisions, no incident has been more fatal than that of the Chaka Dadri mid-air collision which occurred outside of Delhi, India on November 12, 1996. The incident involved two large planes, an American-built Boeing 747 flying for Saudi Arabia's Saudi Airline and a Russian-built Aleutian 76, a large utility plane which also happened to be carrying passengers on that occasion. The two planes were flying in opposite directions, with one flying in and one flying out of Delhi. The collision over Chakadadri became the deadliest case of a mid-air collision ever to occur. But how did two massive planes collide like this? Who was controlling the airspace? And was there technology which could have prevented this? The Delhi area of India has a population that ranges into the tens of millions. The large city is served by Indira Gandhi Airport. Every year, millions of people pass through this airport, but the airport today is certainly different from what it was. Prior to its major expansion which saw the completion of a new terminal in 2010, the airport was relatively small for the level of traffic which it served. In the late afternoon of November 12, 1996, a Saudi Airlines Boeing 747 was preparing for departure out of Indira Gandhi Airport. On board were 312 passengers and 23 crew. Their destination, Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, via Damams Dharan Airport. On the flight deck piloting the plane was Captain Khalid Al Shubaili, age 45. He recently passed a proficiency check on his plane, the 747-100. His total flight experience amounted to just under 10,000 hours, but he was still relatively new to this plane with just over 100 hours logged. Sitting next to him was 37-year-old Nazir Khan, who was actually American. He too was a captain and was more experienced on the 747 than Shubaili, but his total flight experience amounted to just under 8,000 flight hours. Also sat on the flight deck was the flight engineer, Ahmed Edris, age 33. He was the least experienced member of the crew, with around 3,300 total flight hours, though he had spent considerable time in the 747. At 6.33pm on that day in November 1996, this Saudi Airlines 747 flying as Flight 763 departed Delhi's Indira Gandhi Airport. After takeoff, the plane began flying west towards the Middle East as it was supposed to. During the takeoff, Flight 763 had been in communication with a Delhi tower controller. The tower controller then promptly handed the Saudi flight off to a departure slash approach controller. When the Saudi crew tuned into the frequency, they were put into communication of a controller by the name of VK Dutta, age 42. Dutta became an air traffic controller in Delhi in 1980 and had been promoted several times throughout his career. He turned up for work at 1.30 p.m. for his afternoon shift and on this evening, he was responsible for arriving and departing air traffic in this region up to 19,000 feet. He guided Saudi 763 through a busy air corridor that runs in and out of Delhi. It's a crowded sky as much of the airspace had actually been designated for use by the military, not civilian traffic. This meant that arriving and departing aircraft in this direction shared the same airway. At other airports, it had been common for arriving and departing aircraft to be given different airways to lower the possibility of any kind of conflict. Airway Gulf 452 is a route that for departing aircraft heads west passing near to the town of Chakidadri, west of Delhi. The airway intercepts multiple VOR beacons before joining another airway and ends. Arriving and departing aircraft both shared this airway, although Air traffic was to be spaced at at least 1,000 feet of altitude apart to avoid conflict. As it were, once Flight 763 was in the air, controller VK Dutta found himself in control of another plane. Kazakhstan Airlines Flight 1907 was inbound to Delhi on a flight originating from Shimkent, Kazakhstan. The aircraft was not a conventional plane, but rather a Russian Aleutian IL-76. The IL-76 is a very large transportation aircraft often used for military and cargo transport. Although on this occasion, the aircraft was carrying 27 passengers and 10 crew for a total of 37 on board. 
the interior had been fitted with a small passenger cabin, which allowed the plane to transport people. The IL-76 is still in production to this day, but its primary use is in transportation of cargo. The plane, at least this model of the type which flew in 1996, required no less than five people to fly. Kazakhstan Airlines Flight 1907 was being piloted by 44-year-old Captain Alexander Cherapanov. He was a highly experienced pilot with nearly 10,000 hours flight time logged. He recently had spent time flying in and out of Delhi, so this route had likely become more routine for him. His co-pilot sat next to him was 37-year-old Captain Ermek Zangarov. He had just under 500 hours in this plane, but in total had amassed nearly 7,000 fly hours. In the navigator's position on the plane was 51-year-old Zahambek Arifiev, by far the most experienced member of the crew, with over 12,000 fly hours logged. Also on board was the flight engineer, 50-year-old Alexander Chuprov, and the least experienced member of the crew was the radio navigator, Igor Rep. The chain of events which brought these two planes to the same spot in the sky at the same time can be broken down as follows. Both aircraft were on frequency with VK Dutta. Saudi Air Flight 763 was at 10,000 feet, but was given an instruction to climb and maintain an altitude of 14,000 feet. Once passing 10,000 feet, the captain settled more into the flight and the seatbelt sign was switched off, but the plane levels off at 14,000 feet. Dutta's radar display only consisted of primary radar, which would only show radar blips of the planes with no flight, heading or altitude information. The technology for this type of secondary radar was around at the time and had already been installed at many major international airports across the world, but in the case of Delhi, the technology was not installed. Perhaps frustratingly, the equipment was already in India, but had not yet been installed due to a lengthy bureaucratic process. This newer radar would work by receiving critical information from the aircraft themselves. Metrics like altitude, heading, and flight number could then be displayed on a controller's workspace. By the time of the disaster at Chakadadri, this technology had just not been installed at Delhi. Instead, as was the case with VK Dutta's workstation, he needed to keep track of these metrics himself. There would have been a certain level of faith put in the flight crews to carry out the instructions accordingly, as with primary radar, Dutta would only have a one-way view of these metrics. Kazakhstan Airlines 1907 had been descending from their cruising altitude in preparation for landing in Delhi. They initially descended down to 23,000 feet, but then VK Dutta gave them a clearance to descend down to 15,000 feet. When Dutta gave the instructions to both the Saudi and Kazakh planes, he did so with the given instruction to maintain said altitude, the Saudi flight at 14,000 feet and the Kazakh flight at 15,000 feet. This would give the planes the appropriate spacing which the International Civil Aviation Organization says is appropriate. Air traffic controller VK Dutta, being a professional, performed his job correctly, and this was evident when investigators listened back to the ATC recordings. Dutta also gave a traffic alert to Kazakh 1907 to look out for the passing Saudi plane. This is a standard practice in aviation, especially in busy airspace. Dutta only gave this advisory to the Kazakh flight, and it was only an advisory, as he would have assumed, having put faith in both flight crews to maintain their appropriate altitudes, that the planes would have been spaced far enough apart to avoid conflict. So to emphasize in this moment, both aircraft are flying along the same airway in opposite directions. One of these planes obviously was not at the correct altitude. We know from a more recent incident in 2001 in the Japan Airlines incident that a pilot may be able to see an oncoming plane. In the Chakidadri incident, however, the two accident planes would enter cloud in their final moments before disaster. For Captain Shubaili and his crew, we must remember that the 747 was flying west during astronomical twilight, and that may have made oncoming traffic difficult to see. When the data was extracted from the Saudi's flight recorders, it was clear that the flight crew also performed their job correctly. Perhaps we could now turn our attention to the Kazakhstan flight to understand what happened. Let's take a closer look at the Aleutian 76, or more specifically, its cockpit. Like some other planes designed in the Soviet Union, the Aleutian 76 requires five pilots. This is also similar to the Soviet civilian plane Tupolev 154, which also required five pilots. 
One member of the crew, the Navigator, even gets a panel located in the plane's distinctive glass nose. The radio operator also gets their own panel. On flight 1907, there seemed to be a bit of a breakdown in communication between the crew. The radio operator, Igor Rep, did not inform the rest of the crew of the following assigned altitude of 15,000 feet, though they acknowledged it to the controller. The reason for this is unknown. This information was picked up by the navigator in the glass nose, who then began converting 15,000 feet into meters. Whereas most people in the world are familiar with metric measurements which are used on a daily basis, aviation is one area where metric units of measurements for various key parameters, such as altitude and distance, are unanimously unfavorable. In fact, the two most noteworthy countries to use meters to indicate altitude in recent times, Russia and China, recently ditched the metric units in favor of feet and miles. Regardless, the pilots of Flight 1907 received the instruction to descend, and so the mass evolution plane began to gradually drop. The time was now 6.40 p.m. when Kazakhstan Airlines 1907 radioed to the ground that they had reached their descending altitude of 15,000 feet. This call was made by the radio operator, not the pilots flying. Some believe that the pilot flying did not know when to level out their plane. This is backed up further as the responsibility of making callouts by the pilot not flying was never made. Captain Cherapanov also did not request the assigned altitude out loud to the rest of the crew until the final moments before collision. By that time, the plane had actually descended below 15,000 feet where they were supposed to stay, and were in fact closer to 14,100 feet. And just like that, the two planes were put on a collision course. The flight engineer of the Kazakh flight, Alexander Chuprov, did notice the plane's unauthorized descent and suggested climbing. The captain powers up the engines and begins to execute a climb. It is believed that had they have not done this, the plane would actually have passed under the Saudi flight, and the accident may not have occurred. How the two planes crashed into each other was as follows. The large left wing of the Illusion 76 clipped the right side engines and wing of the 747. The Boeing explodes and plummets to the ground. The Kazakh flight actually continues on and even climbs exceeding 15,000 feet before falling to the ground. For the passengers and crew on both planes, it would have been a horrifying final few moments of their lives. Supposedly, the last thing said on the cockpit voice recorder of the Saudi plane was a prayer. Controller VK Dutta, as expected, would have seen the two blips on his radar screen representing the two planes merge. Afterwards, he would expect them to move apart again as the planes passed. For a moment, just try to put yourself in Dutta's position as an air traffic controller, responsible for the safe coordination of air traffic in your sector. Having two large planes simply vanish off your radar. Saudi Airlines Flight 763 and Kazakhstan Airlines Flight 1907 collided in midair over the town of Chakidadri, west of Delhi. Though one building was destroyed on the ground, there were no ground fatalities. There was one eyewitness to the crash, a US Air Force pilot who happened to be flying in the area by the name of Timothy Place. He noted back to air traffic control of a large orange glow emanating from a layer of cloud. 349 people are dead in what is still to this day the deadliest case of a mid-air collision. Regular viewers of the channel may have noted that thus far, I have neglected to mention a key piece of technology, the Traffic Collision Avoidance System, or TCAS for short. TCAS is a piece of equipment which interacts with a plane's transponder. It effectively notifies flight crews of other aircraft flying close by. The technology is supposed to prevent the exact thing from happening which occurred that day in India. As to why I am only bringing it up now, to put it simply, neither plane had TCAS equipped. It was not a mandatory piece of equipment at the time. This changed following this disaster. Airspace in India was also changed to allow more space for aircraft. Though mid-air collisions had occurred prior to 1996, even with the advent of the TCAS technology, mid-air incidents still occurred with passenger planes, most notably in 2001, 2002, and 2006. In the last 15 years, 
An incident like this has never happened again. Hello everyone, thank you for watching. If you found this video to be interesting, be sure to like and subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. The channel has been growing quite a bit and we recently surpassed 65,000 subscribers so a big thanks is warranted to all who tune in every week to watch the new videos. I haven't missed a weekend this year and I don't intend to, now we're in December. This means that there will be a video on Christmas Day as that day happens to be a Saturday. Anyway, I shall move on to thanking my patrons over on Patreon for their support. If you would like to have your name on screen or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Patrons also get early access to all new videos 48 hours before they go out publicly on YouTube. So a thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Avery Teoda, Hunter Heilman, Hector Palmateles, Joey, John Ambrosia, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morins, Leon San Jennings, MG, Michelle, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, MX Koifish, I hope that's the way you say it, Pac-Man 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Pipsqueak, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Saria Melody, Sleepy, Su 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 Shoes, Tristar Triforce, and Tristan Kriegsman. And a special thanks to my £10 tier patrons for the incredibly generous support. Ada Montgomery, Alan Altman, Anne Sid, Bard Ghost Isu, Derek Bean, Aaron Wilson, Extreme Brooklyn Accent, James Bluke, Karma, Megan Garrick, Mike Milton, Roger Mayer, So FP, Steve Cottrell, Thick Coconut, Vapranva, and Where Are My Cheetos? Thank you all so much, and that is it for me this week. Have a good weekend, and I will see you next week. Goodbye!